What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to day 80 of Autodesk Fusion. Today we're working on something a little bit different than what we've done ever on this channel or on this series. And is, all right, I've made my 3D part. What can I do next with it? How do I get this to a 3D printer? How do we get it to work? And what can we do with it? So if you already know, if you can say very easily, you can answer yourself the question, can I 3D print this? If you understand how to get to all the steps there to making an actual 3D print, this video is not for you. I'm gonna very slowly go through all of the vocab just so people can start to get a grasp on what does it look like to take your 3D model and then being able to 3D print it. And so if this is not for you, feel free to move on, spend your time elsewhere. But if this is kind of your very first time figuring out how to 3D print or how to take this 3D printer, Feel free to stick along with me. Okay. Alrighty. So what we're going to do is talk about file types and uh, what we can do with those file types before we begin. Now, Fusion does a very wonderful job in its exports, but sometimes they take a little while. The reason being is that Fusion, since it's a browser-based environment, your exports and when you're trying to save things to your computer, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. And here's what I mean by that. So if I click on File and we click on Export, what we have never talked about before is what kind of export do you want? And so if we scroll down here, we can find uh, that the types we can save it as is a bunch of different types of files. We can even save this as a .ipt if you wanted to transfer it over to Inventor. You can save it as a drawing file, DXF, object files. But the one we're going to talk about right now is an STL file. Now an STL file, it says this file type requires cloud translation, will take, which may take a few minutes. You tell it where to download, and then you're good to go. For the sake of this video, I've already done that, and I've already downloaded this as an export. So what I'm gonna do now is open up a program, it's called a slicer program. And what a slicer program does is it takes that STL file, which stands for stereolithography. It's a file type based off of uh, back in the late 80s when 3D printing was just starting. Uh, it was crazy to think about that. Didn't even know that was the thing. But it was uh, a way for a computer to understand 3D geometry by instead of just saving as what it is, it actually breaks it up in a bunch of lines and triangles. You don't have to worry about any of that. All you need to know is exporting it as an STL. What you can then do is then import it. And so what we got here is we've got some imports of what we have of these pieces so far. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just bring on one of those into my environment. So this is my slicer program. And what this slicer program does is depending on which one you're using, this is Kira, I prefer Kira, I just find it to be super helpful. I don't really need very many bells and whistles that are offered with other uh, slicer programs. This one is kind of plug and play, ready to roll. When you first uh, download it and install it, it's gonna ask what kind of 3D printer you have and then it's gonna automatically throw in all of the default features, temperature nozzles, everything like that that you need for your 3D printer. So it works beautiful. So let me show you how a slicer program actually works. So this is my 3D model as an STL. What does it do exactly? And as a preview, we're going to go ahead and slice this thing. And what it does is it creates my three, it tells my 3D printer line by line in that code what to do and how to print it. So it tells it what that infill looks like, what the support materials look like, and then also on top of that, anything else that I tell this environment to do. So by default, uh, you can do, a, I, I usually do a low quality print just because they're a little bit quicker. I really don't need a high quality print for a classroom just because the things we're dealing with. Infill density, I found to be very successful, 10% is really all you need unless you're having something test really, really high stress loads. But since we're usually probably 3D printing for our automatas or things like that, which really are not high stress environments, a 10% infill density works totally fine. Depending on what kind of 3D printer you have, if you're new into it, I would suggest two things. One is that you always check support and adhesion. And what that does is it causes there to be a layer between the bed of the 3D printer and your object, and it creates a nice big platform for that piece to adhere to. 
And so if I slice this again, what we're going to find in is that now there's this skirt around my 3D printer and it helps prevent warping. So if you've got your 3D printer calibrated perfectly well, it's in, a, it's in a controlled environment where the temperature isn't too cold or too hot or changes quickly, you really don't need an adhesion plate. But if I'm printing a long 3D print, I usually throw an adhesion plate just to be on the safe side of things. It wastes very, very little material and uh, it just helps guarantee and it puts better accuracy in my part. So if you have a nice long piece or a nice tall piece that you're trying to make, I really recommend doing an adhesion. And so all it does is it creates this layer for that wider base for that first layer to start printing. What is support exactly? And so I particularly chose this piece uh, because the problem you run into with a 3D printer is the way it prints, you can't have what's called an overhang too much. So if I take this support out and I slice it, this piece, and maybe we'll hop back over to Fusion and see it, I intentionally did this piece because it has a cavity on the inside of it. And so the problem you run into is this printer is going to 3D print all the way up to that cavity, and then boom, it's going to start printing that layer. That will instantly fail. So how do you fix this? Well, you do what's called a support layer. And so by doing a support layer, and then we slice it, what we can then see then again is that as it prints upwards, it's going to print out this layer of support that will snap away from your 3D print. It's a nice snap away. That way, when it prints this first layer of your actual material, that material just doesn't fall and cave inwards. Now, if you're watching this video for a little bit, you know a little bit about 3D printers, like, well, how else can we print this to where we don't have so much support material? And that comes a little bit into you being able to understand how to use your 3D model environment. So I'm going to click on this piece, and instead of printing it like this, we can rotate it, and we can print it upside down. And so let's go ahead and rotate this all the way around. And then just to make sure that everything looks okay. Okay. And that looks all right. So what we're doing now is instead of printing it right side up and having that huge support layer to be thrown away, what happens if we now do this where we have a support layer, um, but on the outside rather than the inside? So when I slice this, we notice that, let's go to this preview, that my support layer is going to be on the outside and that's going to snap away and that way I don't waste near as much material. So let's, let's try that again. So we got 30 grams of material going to be used. It tells us the hour is going to be 2 hours and 39 minutes. So let's go ahead and flip this on over again and see what that time is going to look like. So it's nothing changed, just flipping it over and we see that it's going to use about the same amount of material and the time is about the same. So this kind of gets into a play of what side of your 3D print do you want to be, I would say, more, uh, I would say have a more uh, nice finish to it. If this top side piece right here is going to have more view or more use, you want a smooth finish on that, that's totally fine. If the bottom piece is going to have more move and use, then you probably would want to do that. This just takes a lot of trial and effort with your 3D printer. Probably I would suggest taking about, if you're brand new to a 3D printer, about a week of failed 3D prints, and then you'll figure out all the ins and outs, and then you'll be good. So the next thing we'll talk about is infill density. Is What we're gonna do is this 27 grams of 10%. What it does, that infill density, is how much of that material is on the inside. So if I do 10% and we slice this, we can see that our material on the inside if there's a lot of open space. It prints these beautiful triangular prisms that's, that's still structurally sound, but it's only 10% of the inside of your 3D model is actually using filament. If we do something more like 80% and then we slice this, you're gonna find out that there's gonna be a lot more material on the inside. And so that's gonna waste a whole lot more filament unless you need this to be an object that's under high stress environment. 
So if I had this to be under high use, probably like a door wedge or something to carry really heavy weight, this is the only reason you'd ever need something this high. But for automatas, it works pretty well. 10% infill tends to work totally fine. Oh, I forgot to mention, let's, let's go back to 80%. And let's go ahead and slice this. That took four, almost five hours. If we do a 10%, we're down to a two hour and 20 minute timer on uh, the 3D printer I have, which is the Ender 3. And so what we got here, folks, is we've got so far of what we're looking at on infill types, supports, and adhesions. Now, the last thing I want to talk about for this video is that outside edge or that profile of how thick your layers are going to be. And by default, I use uh, the thickness, the largest thickness available on my nozzle, just because, like I said, this is for an engineering classroom. We don't need highly finished artistic looking pieces. So if I, bring, if I bump down this profile layer a whole lot, let's go back to prepare, let's bump this down a whole lot and then slice it again, we should see that my runtime is gonna skyrocket. It's gonna go through the roof. So if you really want to learn how to use a 3D printer, I really recommend you use a larger profile, lower infill percentage, support and adhesion plates until you get used to your 3D printer and then start to play from there. Okay guys, that's gonna be it for this video on how to take your model in Fusion, how to bring it into a slicer and what that environment looks like. Good luck if you have any particular questions on how to use a slicer or what slicer programs are best for your 3D printer. Probably a Google search would be best for that. However, if you have an Ender 3 and you use Cura and have any questions, feel free to shoot them my way. If I don't know it, I'm most likely gonna Google it, and so that probably be the best chance for your answers as well. If you need anything, feel free to throw them down in the comment section. And then uh, for the next 20-ish videos, we're gonna do some really interesting small projects on what we can do with things we've done in Fusion and put them into the real world. I have something uh, down the pipeline that I would like to make, and so I actually might spend the last 10 days making just that model. Okay. Alrighty guys, I will catch you on the next video.